Thank you all for being here this evening. Wonderful crowd. Uh, my name is Martin Brody. I'm a member of the music department at Wellesley, and uh, it's a great, great joy to be able to introduce this program. One of the things I wanted to say uh, in introducing this tonight is that this is really uh, the last section of the tripartite program, which began yesterday with a quite wonderful lecture by Arnold Davidson and George Lewis, uh, the Jordan Lecture uh, on Improvisation as a Way of Life. Uh, this morning, uh, George and Arnold and Vijay joined a number of Wellesley faculty and uh, our colleagues from other institutions for a magnificent three-hour, very intensive seminar. And this evening we have this performance, which uh, concludes this series of activities. Uh, it's important to mention all three of these things because tonight's event uh, is both an interactive performance with George Lewis and Vijay Iyer, but also an interactive uh, engagement uh, of all of us uh, with uh, George and uh, Vijay and also Arnold Davidson, uh, our uh, dear friend and colleague who has uh, been in a kind of ongoing dialogue especially with George for a number of years now uh, about, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll wait till later to say what it's about, but uh, we will uh, go directly from uh, a continuous performance uh, of a George, a direct performance of George and Vijay, directly into a conversation uh, with the audience, uh, which will include Arnold, uh, George, and Vijay. Uh, and I also wanted to make a very big shout out to my colleague Carol Doherty, uh, the director of the Newhouse Center for the Humanities at Wellesley, who has not only been a brilliant uh, director for a few years now, uh, but also uh, the ideal collaborator in this project, uh, which really has been about uh, the interweaving of creative and critical uh, action together uh, in a way that we hope will be distinctive for many programs uh, in the future. Uh, with that, thank you very much again for being here, and I hope you will enjoy and participate in the program this evening.
Thank <laughs> you. 
couple of minutes and then we'll have a conversation about what we just heard and so on. And, uh, and maybe people can ask questions about what was going on, anything they'd like to do. We think about improvisation, we think about computers and so on. And so we'll just have a, a brief chat about that, not too, not too, you know, not too long, you know. So one of the one of the interesting things about this concert is we all heard it together at the same time and no one knew what was going to happen. Not even George Lewis, who programmed the computer, knew what was going to happen. So we've all had the same experience at the same time and our idea is to talk about what we just heard and to ask some questions about what it makes us think about when we think about improvisation. So I think I'm going to start with just asking Vijay, since it's the first time he's played with this interactive piano, if he could just describe for us his experience of what it was like to start playing with it. Uh, thank you uh, for letting me do this, first of all. <laughs> um, you know, I guess the, do the, the dice were slightly loaded for me because I've been following this project since the early 90s. So I, and, you know, and I have a certain relationship with the software as creator. <laughs> um, but I've never played it before, so this was the first time doing that. Um, but I am familiar with some of the kinds of choices that it has made in the past, anyway. And also, I was interested um, backstage in what George characterized as its mood today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was intrigued by the prospect that it might be in some kind of mood that, uh, that I would then have to deal with. Not, you know, not, so in other words, not just note by note or phrase by phrase or gesture by gesture, but some kind of holistic assessment of where things are at. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of, uh, I guess, the, the uh, spirit that I took it in. Um, and I should also say that uh, George and I have a, a, an interesting, more recent relationship in that our children are the same age. And I kind of was reminded of um, just last month when he brought his son to my daughter's birthday party. <laughs> and, you know, um, well, the fact is we want our kids to be independent. Uh, mm. But sometimes we know that they need help doing that. And so there was a certain um, sense I got from George just before we went on stage that there was what he wanted it to do, and then there was what it might do anyway. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> so I, I think I was kind of mindful of that. You know, like initially we were thinking, well, why don't you guys start together, meaning me and the computer? Why don't you guys start playing together? And then just before we went on, I said, you know what? Let it start by itself. So then I was thinking, okay, well, maybe you could play for 10 minutes by itself. But then after about two minutes, I was thinking, um, I'm not sure exactly if I'm reading its mood correctly, but I do feel that it wouldn't hurt for me to get involved. Here, so. now it's interesting that you say that, because yeah. I, I actually thought when it started playing by itself, it, it often plays by itself at the beginning of these concerts. and. I, it seemed to me it was a little timid. I, I was a little worried about it right at the beginning. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 sometimes when it starts, um, it really exerts its own personality in a very, very forceful way. And it was a, a little timid. It happens with musicians as well, um, that is human ones. And then what was, I thought, quite extraordinary is when you came in and started playing with it, it seemed a bit inspired. <laughs> it, 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 really, it really did start Better. Playing better um, as a result of, of interacting with you, so its its mood kind of changed a little bit, um, and and as it played um, more and more with you, it it seemed to be able to react to you in a way which kind of made it overcome some of its timidity at the beginning. I must say that the feeling was kind of mutual that I was also, <laughs> and uh, it inspired me. You know, yeah, I mean, we did kind of talk about that because you know, I, you know I've been, I've done a, a lot of these concerts, as you can imagine, because the first 
piece that I did with computers interacting was in 1979. And so, uh, you know, that's a pretty long time. Some of you probably weren't around then. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and the kind of computers we have now weren't around then either. So back in the day, basically, if you wanted to do computer music, you had to build the computer first. And then you could do the music. So that's the tradition I kind of come from. The basement bomber, itinerant computer hacker builder. Anyway, um, pre-internet, all that. <clears throat> so anyway, yes, and so uh, it was, we did have this discussion because what I try to do is the basic, the basic form of the piece goes something like this. Well, okay, we'll let the computer start playing, and it, you know, if it does a good job, just let it play until it seems not to be doing a good job anymore, and then come out and do something. But I've been rehearsing all day, and, and I just didn't feel that was going to work. It was in a kind of a funk, you know. It, it just wasn't doing, you know. I had to try different stuff. It was software tweaks and all that. It, you're not supposed to do it. You not, you don't, shouldn't have to do that. But I was kind of wondering, what's going on here, you know? Uh, you, you know, take its temperature, anything, you know. And so at a certain point I realized that that wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to be able to, even though I'm glad you liked the opening of it, it wasn't going to be able to, it, we pretty much called it. <laughs> it wasn't going to be able to, like, do an interesting opening solo, and it was going to need some help uh, from the outset. And so we kind of provided that help, and, and then things proceeded from there. And, you know, there are always these moments when I feel kind of redundant. I mean, you know, I don't really have to play in the concert. In fact, Vijay doesn't have to play in the concert. I mean, you know, on a good day, it can play the concert by itself. So this wasn't a particularly good day for a solo performance. It was a good day for a group uh, interaction. And so what we ended up doing was more of a, a group interaction and, um, and certain things that happen in the course of the music that don't normally happen because of the initial conditions being kind of different. And so it's hard to explain why it is, how you can feel that the computer is in a particular mood, but it's just the way it is. And when you get to know something for a while, and like I could just tell that certain things you know, you know, you're with somebody, you just know that it's not going to go the way, the particular way. That's all. You just got to adjust. As long as we're talking about the mood of the computer, my sense as a listener was that the computer was in the mood to listen. And that it was uh, very, very responsive when Vijay came in. And uh, it was startling to me in turn at how responsive Vijay was to the computer. And the rhythm of uh, interaction uh, immediately became extremely interesting, well, extremely probably. interesting, and very uh, variegated. So, uh, as long as we're characterizing the mood of the computer, I would say that uh, that something immediately it it sensed um, a responsive interlocutor, a responsive partner. Now, one of the things we've been talking about for the last two days is is the problem of learning how to listen, and especially learning how to listen to completely improvised music where you don't know in advance what's going to happen and you've got to actually attend to what's happening in a very specific way. And that involves all of us since you had to listen as well. And uh, I, I think we're interested in how you listened. And I, I wanted to just ask Vijay if the way you listened to it playing when you were, were playing with it had any specific features that were different because it was a computer? Did you just listen to it like you would listen to another musician you might not know very well? Uh, you know what? What I was surprised by myself is the way my own playing was so transformed. In the sense that, uh, I guess my instinct when I'm playing with somebody is not to do the opposite of that person, but to do something that that person is not doing. Yeah. Because otherwise, It's nice to have a, a, some kind of a spectrum or sense of belief within any given moment in music. That's my own aesthetic or my own feeling. And what I felt was that somehow um, I wanted to do things that, that were um, physical in the sense that I wanted to do um, kind of bodily gestures rather than really think I'm in the domain of the notes mm -hmm. or words. I wanted to do essentially what I didn't hear it do, which was right. 
using limbs and digits to achieve certain things with it, with each with its inherent strengths. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, I know a little bit about the nuts and bolts, what's under the hood of it, but I, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how it's stringing together ideas or even creating ideas exactly. But I do know that one way that I as an improviser create ideas is by exploring the interface between me and not me, or mm -hmm. me, in particular me and the instrument. And so that's what I found myself wanting to do more, maybe because I didn't hear that happening anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to just posit that as some sort of a lack in the music. It was more like, um, that was the kind of response that I felt was possible. And then when George came in and you were playing in the trio, did that then affect that aspect of your playing? Uh, yeah, well, there was a, you know, the, the fact of another embodied presence mm -hmm. uh, kind of changes the, then changes the balance. And so maybe I felt less compelled to do that. But then, on the other hand, I haven't played with George in about 15 <laughs> years or something. I'm curious if I've played like, yeah. Before him and after him, but never with him <laughs> since the nineties. So, uh, so there was a certain sense that I just wanted to kind of um, rise to that. See, the last time we played together, I, I, I'm fair to say that I mean, you were a very different musician from what you were then, and uh, you have a lot of new ideas, and there's been a, a long history. Uh, but then it occurred to me that you are probably the only person who's ever played with this system who, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I just say, that. I don't mean to be crude about it, but who knows as much about computers as I do. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, so like, and so the thing is that because of that, you know, when you hear these things happen, you have a sense of why they're happening and how they're happening. You don't know exactly what the algorithm is, but if I told you, you would know. Or if I showed you the thing, you would be able to figure it out. And so the thing is that because of that, I was wondering, you know, is that a knowledge that you carry into the space and does that enter into the strategy? Or do you say, well, I mean, or you say, well, it's, it's just another, this is part of the environment and it's not that I look at it. You know, you might sort of start to think, well, at a certain point, well, that's the kind of thing a computer would do, you know, some bonehead thing that it's doing right now. Or, you know, and I try to avoid the kind of bonehead moments and have as few as possible. <laughs> but there are certain kind of key bonehead things where one of the big bonehead things that happens in a lot of interactive or, you know, gener computer generated music is suddenly start shouting for no apparent reason, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so that's when people say, oh, that's random, you know. <laughs> So those are the kind of things that this thing doesn't really do anymore. But the, the, the thing is that, you know, like like a like a like someone. Well, never mind. You know how the kind of people you think of is someone sitting on the subway and starts shouting for no apparent reason. You try to move away from them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what happens in music too. If someone starts doing that, you kind of move away from them. So, but because of that, is that a knowledge that you can bring to bear on this experience, or is it just, just something that you can bracket out? Well, I guess I think about what it's not doing, that I know I'm doing it. I, know, I only know I'm doing it because I've noticed myself doing it with the phones, which is that I'm not only listening to the musicians, I'm listening to the audience. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm not aware of you and the program being any such module. Yeah. I'm kind, of kind of like, not just listening to the audience, but kind of like listening to the space. Because what I know that it's doing for me is gathering pitch and velocity. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure if it knows about the pedal. Does it know? Uh, it doesn't know about the pedal. It can do the pedal, but it doesn't know about it. That's right. It doesn't know about my pedal. Right. Right. So, so that's a. You know, so basically, there's an aspect of it. Or does it? Wait. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Right. It doesn't, look like or, it, it doesn't because the pedal interface is hooked up. That's right. right. Ah, so. Okay. so then there's like an aspect of resonance that. Is um, not registering to the list to this listener. Right. So I think I noticed that, mm -hmm. about it, that um, a certain kind of uh, set of information could be delivered in multiple ways, but would maybe be decoded in the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So that's, but that said, you know, it's never responding in the this way. So that's, um, in other words, it, it, it behaves, it manifests to him that's more like a person that you want to know more about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, that's, thanks. <laughs> no, it's funny because if you're playing with it, if you built it and you play with it, then there's the part where you should know kind of what it does because you built it. But in fact, the knowledge from the actual performance and that experience trumps the knowledge that came from the building of it. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. go first to the, oh, it's now doing this thing that I built into it. Mm -hmm. You're doing it, oh, you've got to, I have to respond to this, this musical event that's happening. And then maybe later at some point, you might also say, well, it doesn't seem to be working quite as I programmed it. Mm -hmm. But that knowledge comes much later. And maybe you, it could be interfering with the experience if you don't, you have to kind of suppress it. So your experience of it is really what you're primarily reacting to without mediating it by the explicit knowledge of how you know it works. Right, you, you don't do that right away. Yeah. It might happen, but it's not the first thing. But that, that seems to me very similar to what the audience has to do, or what I and the audience have to do. I, you know, I, you look at the thing and you see there's a human behind one of them and not behind the other, and you start by being a little perplexed um, <laughs> about what's going on. And then if you actually just start listening to it, and you, your, your experience, as opposed to your questions, start to be at the center of what your listening's about, you know, there are moments when you just stop thinking about who's sitting behind the piano and you're listening to the sound that's coming off of the piano. And so the experience of it, even if you knew, you know, what was into it to make it work, mm -hmm. no longer sort of matters aesthetically to you. I mean, you come back to that afterwards, you ask yourself a whole series of questions, but, you, you know, I've, I've sometimes just asked people to listen to part of the concert closing their eyes. You know, when they mm -hmm. when they do, they 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 don't ask themselves anymore. They're just they sometimes are wondering, well, which which one's the human and which one's the computer. But that disappears very very quickly. And and we're sort of curious about your experience as well. Yeah. After yeah. after your initial, I don't I don't know. You can tell me what it was: surprise, shock, uh, bafflement, um, interest in in seeing the the two pianos playing together, did you just start listening? Did you listen to Vijay in a different way than you listened to the computer? Were you just in the aesthetic experience and at some point it didn't matter to you that, you know, one of the pianists had a body and the other one looked an awful lot like a laptop? Um, <laughs> um, what was your experience of it? Well, I see at least one person here who knows what, what's going on under the hood. But um, are people got to, you, you were saying, I guess that, what that means is we're supposed to give the microphone up to you guys, right? How, where is the, the, the yeah, anybody nice. has, if anybody has any questions or comments or complaints or observations or anything, you know. Hello? Yep, you're on. Um, Even with the mic, yeah, I'm not can, hearing you can very hear well. Just talk um, to it a little bit like this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm new to the project. This is the first time I've heard of it. Um, but I just am curious to know if the computer um, is able to improvise to itself. Does it ever itself perfect itself from the previous performance? Is there is it people that you can understand me? You know, it's, 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 it's a very interesting question because, you know, the nature of these kinds of things is that they're always self-referential because they're, they're, the self-reference is built into the structure of the, the box itself. In other words, it comes with a certain set of cultural references, it comes with a certain set of histories, and those histories are kind of embedded into the structure of the, of the, of the device and how the, how the program operates for itself in terms of its own playing. Now, I think the other question is, does it listen to itself? That's the, I think that's what you're asking, right? Or is it something like that, right? It's called the, the one you talked about before, the one you just said uh, right now, I said it's asking that, and it's 
Okay, well, that's a bonus, okay. Well, the funny thing is that um, I should have these things sort of listen to themselves, but then I wonder what they will be listening for, you know. In a certain way, I'm wondering how much I listen to myself, you know. I mean, I know that at a certain stage there's, I'm monitoring certain bodily functions, and I'm thinking, well, let's see, hmm, I haven't played the trombone in a while, let's get a little tired here. <laughs> Got to figure out some rope dope strategy. Um, <laughs> and uh, and um, so those kinds of things don't really happen in this instance. But the curious thing about them is that what I sort of found over the years of doing this is that a lot of the things that I thought were necessary in order to produce human level music weren't necessary at all. And, uh, and that um, another thing that I often heard about was, well, was it, was the computer sort of learning something? And we were talking about this the other day that there's a couple, and that was sort of the, the holy grail of AI of the 90s was the thing learning, you know? And there are two things kind of happen in that. First of all, a lot of the computers that learn, learn the wrong thing and they stopped working. Um, the other thing that happened was that, um, that um, um, and they were very brittle, a lot of the ones that did it. And then the other thing that happened was that people realized that some of the most successful species on the planet are so stupid they don't learn anything, but they're, <laughs> but they're likely to outlive us. And so at a certain point, I began to think, well, is this learning really what I need to be dealing with? Shouldn't I just concentrate on this thing as a composer, as a composer, performer, improviser, and thinking about interactivity and trying to see how we can manifest the communication between, well, you could almost call it interspecies communication, but certainly inter-entity communication. And so that's the lens that I decided to concentrate on in order to make sense out of these, out of the, you know, what we, the practice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You hear me? Okay. Yep. Uh, you heard a little bit about uh, the, that we don't explicitly know the algorithms that software works very well. But just, just as, a, as a demonstration, could you play, say, a little bit of the star and show how it responds? No, I don't do demos, sorry, I only do pieces. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're, no, I don't like doing demonstrations, you know. I mean, I, we just had a 30-minute demonstration of what goes on. You know, right. you know, the thing is, you know, in the sort of thing where, is it like a train seal? No. So I'm not going to do that. Sorry. EJ, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said you were listening to the audience. Are this curious to be listening to the Well, um, Part of what's happening in a situation with an audience is that um, you're sharing your experience of listening. Right? And I mean, I find that, you know, for example, I might think when I play a note that I want the first and the last note, you know, which means that that's going to affect the kind of for a second, of course, but also um, the space around it. So I guess I'm listening to the space around events in the music as if I were on a stage. Um, so I guess that's a, maybe a more accurate way to put it. It's not just that I'm listening to you guys breathing, although I, you know, I, can hear you. I guess we can hear that. Um, but I, I'm more kind of imagining myself in your shoes. <laughs> hmm. So you're listening to get that. Yeah, I guess that, you know, metaphorically and otherwise, I'm listening for uh, what happens after I play. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hmm. Yourself, uh, drawn into you know, competitive mode 
Which part do you want to hear first? I mean, maybe I'll go to the second part first, because that seems more like it. I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not from the cutting contest era. So, you know, that was all gone by the time I came along. So I don't think I could really reproduce that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were, you know, my era was, you know, people saw that as kind of, well, maybe a little silly. I mean, it, maybe it produced a kind of, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was a social Darwinist moment in music. But, um, but I think what happened was it got superseded by people who realized that cooperative strategies were going to be the order of the day, you know, the civil rights movement, things of that sort. You know, you could see those as a harbinger of the end of that era of like, you know, competition and duels to the death that people like Ralph Ellison were like so enamored with. <laughs> and that, that kind of ended. People don't do that anymore. Um, when they get together to improvise, the idea is they're trying to make space for each other to realize each other's possibilities. And that's the ideal, I think. Um, we don't learn anything from the competition motif. Um, so this is a cooperative uh, thing we see on stage, and it's probably going to remain so. Uh, I think that's more like the ethos that I find in most uh, improvised music. So I could tell you a lot of things about how it works, but it might be boring to people. Um, but it, maybe you could ask a specific question. <laughs> Or maybe we could ask someone, maybe I could tell you later in a private way or something. Uh, on the question of the competition or complementation and all that, as a listener, one thing that struck me is that when the music became most active and most dense and when the three elements were all together uh, at their greatest intensity, uh, it seemed to be the harmonic rhythm actually slowed down and became more, uh, there was a kind of volume uh, of resonance that was um, very beautiful and, and uh, integrated uh, as a sound. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know what that has to do with what was under which hood, but uh, <laughs> it certainly was nothing like a cutting you know, competition mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, I, I wanted to say one thing about the, what, what George was called the cooperative strategies, because now that we've, we've done this and had these discussions, a, a lot of times I always look for something specific that someone says um, that's different than what they've said before. And so I think it's quite extraordinary that you said, you know, you're, you're also listening to uh, the spaces beyond the stage around the audience and thinking about um, what the sound of that note's going to be through empathy there, because that seems to me a yeah. way of including the audience. I mean, you're part of the performance then. It's hard enough to listen to one person. It's very hard to listen to more than one. Yeah. And yeah. Um, when they're spatially separated, but that, just the very, the very articulation of that ideal, I think shows that it's part of a, a kind of social strategy of making the people who are listening part of what's participating in the event itself. And that changes the event. Yeah, it does. Okay. You can have my mic if you want. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, just... <laughs> Well, so that I could sit down if I had to do something to it. But ordinarily, would you, would you put one in front of the, the disc of the year? Well, you know, this series of pieces, I started, I was doing disc of pieces before, but this actual, this program is the outgrowth of a piece we did at Carnegie Hall in, in 2004. And it was, a, it was a piano concerto, except the piano soloist was one of these things. And, um, and there was an orchestra, and the orchestra was playing mostly written music, but there were moments that we could improvise. And, and we had it set up so there were microphones in the orchestra so people could hear. And so that was the, that was the question as to whether there would be like a, there were two questions. Number one, whether there would be a stool there, which would represent some <laughs> absent presence. And we decided against that because there was no absent presence. You know, there was just a presence. And the other thing was whether um, we were gonna show people the keys moving 
and we decided against that because we wanted people to concentrate on the sound, and uh, and that was what what was most important. And the sensibility of the sound, and if we if it wasn't if it wasn't communicating through the sound, then it would, didn't matter what people were the keys and all that gadget stuff, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, they do. Uh, yeah, if, if you want, we could show you. But basically, they do kind of move. But I decided to stop doing that. First of all, because if I turn the keys around, then the piano's you know, the thing is you know it's, it's projecting to the back. You don't want that. You know, so we privilege the sound now. Oh, there's the MIDI thing. MIDI, that's 20-year-old protocol data transfer, you know. It sends a 30, is it 30? Is it 30? Uh, 80, well, it started in 84, 94, 04, 20. That's, that's a, God, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah, come on. Sure. I'm dating myself. Okay, there we go. Yeah, 84. Yeah, so basically it sends a little data thing out and it says play a note with this, with, at this loudness uh, or, and, and that's it. And, but then, there's, there's all these algorithms related to trying to get it to have a supple touch, you know, it's that funny thing that pianists do, they, they have a certain touch, you know, so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get it to have, you know, the touch that would seem inviting, and so, especially because, you know, it was going to be playing with these orchestral musicians, and we didn't want them to get mad at us, and say, oh, we're playing with this awful thing, you know, and they, <laughs> they go home to their friends, and they say, oh, it's this good, ridiculous gig by this guy, you know, he's playing with <laughs> and then, you know, it's good orchestration with the computer thing, forget it, you know. Uh, uh, I'm interested in something you said in response to earlier question, which is the, the learning of the, of the... Oh, there you are. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, which is the... How do you how do you do what now? How it has communication without memory. Well, I'd say there was no memory. There's a little memory. I mean, there's a tad of memory. You know, I mean, it's a very it's a very stupid memory. I mean, you know, it does have a list of the notes that Vijay and it's heard. You know, and it works with these notes, and it's got a, a list of the velocities, and it's got other kinds of little lists. It's got lists of the interval width, and it's you know, it's got these lists, and it's got and these. I wouldn't call, I'm calling them this metaphorically, but what they really are is a set of um, low-pass folders, like leaky capacitors. And so basically, this sort of average state of things over the last, you know, tens or so seconds is expressed by these things. So it's in, and then that memory gets refreshed kind of continuously. And the thing is that long-term memory, I found you didn't really need. It's a funny thing because, I mean, you could do it, of course. You could you, arbitrarily, you know, the thing is about computers, you can, you can have the computer write something down that it heard last year and then bring it to the concert and then play it. And then the first thing you want to say is, what does that have to do with what we're doing now? Mm. <laughs> you know, why did you bring that stupid thing in from last year? You know, instead of like listening to what we're doing now. And so, you know, I found that I had a lot of capabilities just because of the nature of programming that were really very much inimical. If I exercised those capabilities, I had to justify why they were being invoked in this case. Uh, and But then, now, you can imagine a situation, of course, in which um, you would want to do that, and then you have to build the logic that allows that to make sense. In other words, something that... Real, in other words, what I've always wanted to build is something that would look at different experiences and had snapshots of and say, well, this kind of looks like what I did at this time, you know? Maybe I'll bring that back in because it kind of looks like what's happening now. And then that would make sense, you know? And that's something I should probably build at some point, you know? But I would say, if I may add, um, part of what I enjoy about Voyager is that it's you know it's it's 
it's modular, basically analytical and generative, right? In the sense that it takes in data, makes some kind of reading of it, mm -hmm. and then it also has generative processes that respond to whatever that reading is, mm -hmm. but not in some way that's mirroring. But it's actually kind of, um, and also isn't just regurgitating stuff and already knows how to do it, but it's actually somehow inventing a new, the same gesture, which is actually an ideal way of improvising. That is not through regurgitation of lips that we know, but through some sort of uh, manipulation of the fundamentals, uh, building block, working with building block. What's a lot, yeah, a lot of primitives. You know, you know, for example, there's that old essay, like, you know, Vannevar Bush, you know, As We May Think, which basically compares thinking to a kind of, you know, navigating a relational database. So the thinking becomes like information storage and retrieval. Well, that's, that's great for capitalism, but it's not so <laughs> great for music. <laughs> and so, so I just wanted to, I, I don't, and actually there are a lot of, there are a lot of ways in, that are built into the program to kind of upend that, to sort of block those kind of simple strategies where the same thing leads to the same result or where you, you, you try to find other plausible sense-making responses to what it hears, or things of that sort, because otherwise you end up with a situation in which it's very rigid and it becomes like the kind of thing you can like make a demo and say, well, look what happens when I do this, bing, and it goes bong, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. you know well, the thing is, and then, and then what people say is, well, hey, you did, you did bing again and it didn't go bong. And you say, well, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> no one really understands that part, you know. But then, you know, what am I, a robot? You know, <laughs> so I don't want to, you know, that kind of robot, you don't, I don't want to build that, you know. And I don't want to play with that kind of person either. But. I just wanted to say that even in human communication, sometimes actually memory blocks your ability to respond appropriately. Now, if you remember certain things, you're not going to actually be responding to what the person is doing now because they might be bad memories. Um, and so the, the interesting thing here is, is it's, uh, the shortness of its memory actually forces it to attend in a heightened way to exactly what it's hearing at that moment. And that probably makes its responses more appropriate. And maybe that's not so bad sometimes to learn when you're communicating with other humans and not just with the computer. What do they say, they, what the psychologists say, uh, Oh, you're playing those old tapes again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> George, um, I have a question about sort of your motive for starting this project. And if you could talk a little bit more about what it is that you learn from learning about improvisation from the computer that you can't learn from playing with DJ or playing with the real um, What do you do? you You mean do I change the program in some way? I guess my question is what do you learn from the computers in the conversation that you don't learn from? Well let me let me answer all the it's could be a long winded answer, but I'm gonna to try to make it brief. Um, you know, I could barely remember why I started this. <laughs> I, you know, like I said, I started doing it in uh, you know, how old was I in nineteen seventy seven? I don't know. Anyway, I'm a lot older now, and <laughs> I remember, you know, I don't remember what happened, but I do remember the idea of wanting to, or believing in, well, it kind of went like this, you know, I was reading all these books about how jazz worked, and people said that jazz was like, you know, what you did was you had a bunch of pre-stored licks that you kind of mixed up and moved around. And then I was watching people and I said, that can't be how it works. You know, that can't be how it works. But how can I show people that's not how it works? <laughs> well, I know, I can build a computer program that, shows it, that, that does that. And so the first, the first programs did exactly that. They, they mixed these licks up and put them in random order. And it sounded good for a while. I said, well, this is boring. I don't like this. And then pretty soon it got to the stage where I started to learn a lot more. What I, was, what I had was suddenly a tool for investigating music. But then it got to the stage where I had a tool for investigating human communication. 
And then it got to the stage where I had a tool for investigating consciousness. And it got to be like an applied kind of philosophy. You know, and I had a philosophy, a small philosophy background. I had some pretty cool philosophy teachers and undergraduates and, and all that kind of thing. And so finally I found, I found a way to use that information, use all that Husserl stuff, all that Wittgenstein stuff in a very interesting way. And to really to sort of engage in a kind of introspection by actually displacing that consciousness in a way that I wouldn't be able to do with another human being. And the other thing is that the better it got at playing and the more difficult it became to perform that displacement, that kind of suspension, you know, um, the more implications, I began to realize that it was a tool for me to understand improvisation. You know, I could listen to improvisations, I could study them, I could do all that, but suddenly there was this thing that was up there that was improvising and it brought, it brought into play all kinds of issues about what kinds of beings improvise, who improvises, uh, what is, you know, people say, well, you can't improvise without a person. Well, I guess I don't think that's true anymore, okay? <laughs> I mean, you can't improvise if you're not animate, you know, these kinds of things. So suddenly issues of identity started to come up. Um, and that's what I was getting out of it. It didn't have to do with just, oh, well, you're replacing a, a person with a machine because we didn't replace anybody. I mean, we just added people, you know. <laughs> but what we did was um, we had a new environment where we could do two things at once. We could, we could do what we're doing now. We could play a piece of music that would also serve as a site for people to investigate these kinds of interesting philosophical issues. And, um, and then we could also have that, have a sensuous uh, aesthetic component as well. So I didn't think that, I, I, I haven't found another way to do that uh, with uh, just people playing, you know, or writing a, a piece or some kind or something like that. Um, and, I, and even certain kinds of computer music that I do that's not interactive or that is somehow composed, you know, that doesn't, bring up those kinds of issues either. You know, it's the interface with the, um, that kind of unknown, that kind of entity which operates in the same space as a musician but which is not human is where you start to realize it starts to point you back to what it really means to be human and that's why I do it. I have How many, how many faders? Fingers. Oh, fingers. Six. Six. It has six fingers. I used to have a lot more, but I found six was enough. Uh, can you say that again? A little, a little louder. I, how would it do what? Since it's less than the end, I guess it's irrelevant. Well, you know, I think of it, I say fingers, but what I really mean is it's sort of like oscillators. There are six oscillators that operate and they produce rhythms and they produce polyrhythms and they are also able to produce rhythms that are irrational. They can produce like, you know, you know, the square root of two type rhythm. They can produce irrational rhythm. They can produce rhythms that won't, won't repeat will repeat once in a thousand years or that kind of thing. So, or, so the thing is they can play things that are like, they can rub their tummies and pat their heads at the same time. <laughs> and so that's what I was really trying to do. So it really, it really doesn't matter about that kind of homology with the human body. It, I'm thinking of it more as that was a sufficient number in order to produce the rhythmic complexity that I needed to produce and also produced the sense that, you know, in a way it's a very romantic piano player. You know, it's very much like a 19th century kind of pianist in a lot of ways, you know. And occasionally brings in David Tudor or something, you know. Or it's, and it, but it doesn't play much like, you know, Cecil or those kind of people, you know. So yeah, that's a, that's, I think that's the sense in which I 
I'm doing this. This comes from an earlier Voyager system. See, this isn't really Voyager anymore. It's really an interactive trio. Voyager was the electronic virtual orchestra, which had 64 fingers. And the thing was about it, it was a virtual orchestra that could do things that a real orchestra couldn't do because it was, because it was electronic, you know, you, one finger could be a flute player, it could be a clarinet player, it could be a trombone player, it could be a violin player, just like that. So you could have 64 violin players or 64 different instruments all at once, and they could all play in diff they could all play in their own tempo, and they could have their own version of C microtonally. So you could play 64 different versions of C within like a, you know, a half a semitone, and so like, that. and so that meant that you could you could play and you could play a part 43 tone scale in one channel, and you could play a you know, major a, a dominant seventh chord in another channel, and, it, you, and you could, there was all that complexity, and it became a question of orchestral management, you know, how to manage, how to manage an in, interactively and on the fly, intelligently, a kind of virtual orchestra that you had all these extra resources, and so that was a part of that was a, a part of the scheme that is not included in this because it's just playing the piano, the piano's not microtonal. So actually, in, a, in some ways, this is simpler than the old Voyager was. And it, and it does, I, I kind of miss the microtonality and I kind of miss those clouds of Harry Parch and stuff. Stuff that, you know, he couldn't have, he liked, you know, like, he, he liked building instruments. And so, and so I would, I wonder what he might have thought about something was using those scales, but could do things with them that you couldn't really do in the physical world. Um, so, oh. Satisfaction? Yeah, so like as a musician, like do you have good friends and bad friends or <laughs> do, you, do sometimes like you're talking about the mood earlier, like do you find that I mean it's just not working out and you start over? Um, well you know you can never start over. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if your life didn't work out, that's just tough. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, um, but yeah, so you better find a way to be satisfied. Um, you know, I kind of look at it like this. I prefer to reserve judgment permanently. You know, I, I want to have the infinite regress before I get to the point where I say, well, I like it or I don't. You know, now that doesn't mean that there's a certain point at which I'm thinking I'm frustrated here, it's not hearing me, I'm not getting my point across, you know, that kind of thing, or it's not doing anything I like and all that kind of thing. And that happens all the time. You just but I don't have a a standard for it. You know, I hate to say it, I don't like to use the word intuition because I don't understand it and I'm sort of suspicious of it. But it's the closest thing to what happens, which is that you know, you feel it, man, that kind of thing. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe you could, what do you think? I mean, you know. Well, one, one thought that crossed my mind, um, you know, we're not supposed to have thoughts. Right? <laughs> one thought that crossed my mind. I'm sure you have play. thoughts when you play. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, who's that person in the second row? Oh, that's my friend. Hey. <laughs> he's, he's frowning. Well, uh, yeah, uh, one thought that crossed my mind was, wow, I wish, on the road, or like do this again, you know, or do a second set, or something like that, where, uh, well, we can do that if you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we never do that, but we should do it. Do you have guys have time? Okay. I mean, are there any more questions first? I mean, is there one way we have one more? I mean, and then we'll maybe play a little bit uh, more. Actually, I have a question. Um, when you said that you You know, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, it's funny. There's, there's, um, yeah, it doesn't have that. You know, I guess uh, there are these machines now that can do that, right? That they can. 
they could recognize this genre, you know, or they can, you know, to the extent that there is such a thing as a fixed genre. So, for that giant steps program that plays in all country music versions. Oh, that the band in a box, band in a box, but it can only play giant steps as country music. You can't <laughs> recognize it. That's but they true. do have these machines now. Somebody showed me one. The guy, at, the guy at Stanford, Bill Wong, he showed me one. A lot of people are working on this automatic music recognition. And you put a little module in there. And so, so I said, well, look, let's play, you know, we played this weird Steve Lacey tune. And the machine was like saying, it was vacillating. And so I, <laughs> I said, well, why is the machine vacillating? Well, so it doesn't, it can't figure out the genre. It's sort of somewhere between jazz and rock. And, and so then that becomes a human judgment. And that gets based, oh, sorry. And that gets based on all kinds of things, you know, like, person's race or ethnicity or whatever it is, we'll say, well, we, we don't, it sounds like, it doesn't sound like jazz for the guys black, so we're going to call it jazz, so we're going to call it jazz. So, and that's something that maybe you want, you might want to build that into the computer programs too, something that like, you know, is a genre racist or something. That, <laughs> <laughs> like you can sort of say, because John, or that police is people to make sure they're doing the right genre for their ethnicity and gender and so on. <laughs> Because that's what happens to genre quite often is that people think of them in very rigid ways. And one of the things that we are actually doing as musicians, we don't really know what genre this is that we're doing. I mean, I don't have a name for it. Probably someone in the audience does, but I don't. I don't think of it that way. So we're just trying to create this piece and, and maybe we'll create another one. It's going to be shorter because it's getting late. But we'll see. And if the trombone's not broken, I'll play too. We'll see. <laughs> I just to see the question of satisfaction is also a question for us because whatever else we might say, the fact that the musicians and the audience want more says something about satisfaction. Uh, well, those who are left want more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank <laughs> you. 